everyone, it's Sharon Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. So many of us love living in Maine for the same reasons. Rural setting, mountains, the ocean, and being closer to nature. But with the privilege of living in such a beautiful state also comes the responsibility of caring for the land and the wildlife that lives here too. I read last year about a woman who has committed her career to helping people do just that. Jerry Vistein is a conservation biologist who focuses her work on carnivores and the vital role they play in maintaining the biodiversity of the planet. Along with her research and collaboration with other biologists, foresters, and organizations in Maine, she focuses on educating the public on these carnivores in our peaceful coexistence with them. Jerry is the founder of the Coyote Center for Carnivores, Ecology and Coexistence, whose mission it is to share the science behind the returning carnivores and what we need, our skills, to live well with them. Thanks to the partnership with Berwick Community TV, I welcome biologist Jerry Vistein who's here to tell us about the great work that's being done with coyotes in Maine. Hello everyone. I'm so very, very pleased to be here. And before I begin sharing with you, I want to express my gratitude to Sharon and the Berwick Public Library for inviting me. I'm very, very pleased. So thank you very, very much. And, and with that, let us speak about Coyote, America's song dog. So the, I've, I really like having the title of my talk being this. So first of all, Americas. So coyote um, is often called America's song dog because coyotes for over 5 million years have lived nowhere else but North American continent. And a lot of other species went back and forth across the Bering Bridge to Asia, but coyotes, they decided we're staying here. And their paws over those five million years very probably have touched every inch of this American continent. So we are finding their, their bones, anthropologists have from up in New Brunswick from 30,000 years ago, New Jersey, ancient, ancient coyote bones in caves in Tennessee. So they've been jogging around all over. Um, and of course the glaciers came and that changed things a bit for them too. But the Europeans came. Um, coyotes were for the most part from Indiana all the way through to the Pacific Ocean um, where they were. But they've been many other places other than that. So they are truly America's song dog. If there's ever a native species, coyote is it. Native to all of North America. And we often refer to coyote as the song dog. This is a question people often ask me when I give my talks or other times. Why do coyotes howl? There are a number of reasons why coyotes howl. So I'll give you three of them. The first one is territorialness. Coyotes, like so other species, including ourselves, are territorial. Okay? And so um, what they do is they, you'll hear them howling in the evening um, at, at dusk, and that oftentimes is a territorial um, call. And so what they're saying to any dispersing coyote that might be moving through or to their neighbor coyotes who live in the territory next to them, we're families here, we are here, we're letting you know it. And so they have this communication with each other that is so efficient and, and so um, developed that coyotes don't do war. They, they don't kill each other. They, they speak the language that they all understand. And so it's, it's, it's wonderful to watch a highly evolved species communicating with each other in territorialness. And of course they do it, they mark their territory as well as they make their rounds. Another reason why coyotes howl is because coyotes, they don't have cell phones. All right, so they, um, and the thing is, is that they come that's gonna be better than cell phones. That we know like in an evening, especially here in Maine, there's a, 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 a wetness or a dampness or humidity in the air. 
and coyotes can hear their own family howling from three miles away. Can you imagine? One is speaking to them, and they're three miles away, they hear it. I, I couldn't go outside and hear too much further than that. So they have amazing radar hears. And so they communicate with each other on many, many, many different reasons. There is a professor at the University of Vermont who did his doctorate um, in, in California, Berkeley, on coyote howling. It took him six years to do it. And he said he barely touched the tip of the iceberg. So we really as humans have very little knowledge of what coyote is saying. We don't know. It's just, I think it's our place is to delight in it and know that wild song is back here in Maine. Another reason why coyotes howl is because they are very, very social and very family oriented. And so um, their family means everything to them. They're like wolves, very, very much so. They just, the structure is slightly different. And so when you hear them at night carrying on, they're just like, we're here together, the family we're just having. They really love to howl and sing. And because we're talking about Coyote America's song dog, I'm gonna have you listen to some of their song right now, okay? And you'll notice, listen to all the things that they, how, what they are singing. And some of it you can feel an absolute delight. They like sometimes pretend they're wolves and then they get into the, we are a coyote jazz, the yipping and yapping. The coyotes love that kind of thing. It's just as wonderful and wild, so let's go. You notice how they do their, their howling oftentimes? It's all of a sudden, we're stopping. And that's how they do it oftentimes. But look at all that diversity of how coyotes, this is just one big celebration that's going on there. Um, so uh, let, let's move on to our, our talk here. So who do you see? You know, oftentimes our relationships um, with uh, um, other living beings on our planet Earth and includes our fellow humans. A lot has to do with our personal perception of them. Not necessarily the reality of who they are, but our perception of them. And in that context, I'd like to share with you some of the words of Edward Abbey, because this is this very same thing. You know, he spent a, a summer in the Arches National Monument in Utah, and after that he wrote his book, Desert Solitaire. And in the preface he said, this is what he wanted to experience when he was there. I want to be able to look at and into a juniper tree, a piece of quartz, a spider, and a vulture, and see it as it is in itself, devoid of all human ascribed qualities, even those of scientific research. And so I ask you, you think as humans we're able to do that? Or who have we learned to see? Who do you see? Or who have we learned to see? And oftentimes the culture that we live in greatly affects how we see other life. That includes our fellow humans too. And definitely wild carnivores. 
So my, my talk is going to be about these perceptions and relationships. So I'm going to be talking about coyote and our Native Americans, coyote and the Europeans and their descendants, coyote and the other wild ones and the land, and coyote and us. So let's start with the culture of our native people. So I'm going to be shifting from one culture to another. So uh, let's go to the culture that, that, that first discovered America, which is our native people, our aboriginal people who lived here for, 30, for se over 17,000 years. So let's speak of coyotes' relationship with them. This is the first time that coyotes ever saw humans, is when the aboriginal people came and they spent long periods of time with them. And so, um, and they gave Coyote their name. So here is an ancient Aztec stonework of Coyote, and the Aztecs were the ones who gave Coyote their name. They called Coyote Coyote, Coyote, but they spelled it like this, okay? And of course, it's been changed a bit, and the E has been dropped, and people differ, say different things, Coyote, but. Coyote likes to be said coyote. And coyote to the Aztecs, that was an honorable title because it means the trickster. Now the trickster in the European thought and the trickster in native thought are two different things. So the native people, the trickster is a very powerful being, almost a deity, almost a spiritual being that kind of goes between the native peoples and their gods. So there's a whole uh, spirituality that they had. And coyote played a huge role in some of the any special animals that they lived with. And coyote seems to be the one that they focused on the most in reference to that because they saw them as this really unique being. The Navajo of the Southwest, they simply called coyote God's dog. And to this day, they call coyote God's dog. Why? Again, that same concept. They're going, coyotes going to the gods. They're the spokesperson back and forth from the gods to the people. And the other is that coyote belongs to, it's God's dog and belongs to no one else. So there's a very deep and powerful relationship. I've spoken to Navajo just a couple months ago. The relationship that they still have with coyotes is very, very powerful. And so Native peoples used coyote in their stories, in all their American, their myths. And the myths were real oral traditions. So uh, um, basically what would happen in our Native peoples, they would all sit around in a circle and the elders would speak with them. And what's the better way to do it than in stories, especially delightful stories? And coyote was always the lead actor in them. And Coyote would be very mischievous and do things that got him into trouble, but he paid for it in the long run. And basically what it was, he was doing was teaching the people how to live in their culture and in their native villages by learning from Coyote. So he was the teacher. For its native people, Coyote has always been the teacher, the messenger. So even today, our native um, authors and poets speak of this learning from the stories. And here is one of them, Larry Littlefield. He says, the life of my people continues in the telling of stories. We are given a way to learn and to live. And so I often ask us, what kind of stories are we passing on to our children? So a another aspect of Coyote's relationship with the Native peoples, which was powerful, is Coyote's curative power and his benevolence to Native peoples. Um, Native peoples and Coyotes had a very respectful relationship. There was no fear there, and, but there was great respect for the wild. And you know, just like today we hear of dolphins saving people, well, coyotes were the same way to native peoples. This is an example um, of an art piece by Olus Murray, um, wildlife biologist back in the 1940s, who drew this. Um, and you can see what it is, is coyote is striving to heal a native hunter that had been injured. The other aspect with native peoples passed on, and these aren't stories, they're like oral tradition they passed on, is that when any native person would be injured or lost um, and away from the rest, 
the coyotes would come and circle them and protect them so no other, the other large carnivores would come and injure them. Okay, I have a story ready for you, okay? And this happens right now here in Maine in our time. Kind of to show that coyotes haven't changed. So this is a story, but it's not a story, it's real. So I think about five or six years ago, I have to keep going more every time I tell the story. Um, it was in, again, a late winter, maybe February. And um, a young man in the area around Rumford, Maine, um, he wanted to go out snowmobiling. So he got in his snowmobiling as dusk was coming and was just having a grand time and started going faster and faster and faster until he lost control of the snowmobile and it hit a great pine and the snowmobile came and fell on top of his legs. There was no going anywhere for him. What he said, he was rescued in the morning because people heard him screaming, um, but all night he said a group of coyotes came and circled him and stayed there all night around him. And in the morning, they were gone. And when I read that in the paper, it was in the Sun paper, I'm like, I can't, coyote has not changed. Their, their benevolence to humans hasn't changed. Our European culture has definitely changed towards them, but not them towards us, which is so amazing what it speaks of this unique species. And also, our native peoples today, we have Dr. Mel Madroma, he lives up in Bangor area, um, and he is part Native American and part Spanish and, um, and English, and Scottish and English, I should say. And he wrote this book, Coyote Medicine, kind of bringing together Native American healing and Western. And look at the symbolism that he's used. This is the front part of the book. First of all, he calls it Coyote Medicine. And look at the symbolism of coyote being the healer. Very, very, uh, very much. And, and in his book, he talks about benevolence and respect leads to healing. And isn't that this great need in our culture that we have today? Very, very much so. It was very real to them. And it is today, too. So with our native peoples, you know, um, all over and here in Maine, we know that, too. The, the land was very special to them. It wasn't just a piece of land to own. It was part of their culture. Their ancestors lived them. It was very precious to them as an expression of who they were as a culture. And those who, those who they shared the land with um, were very important too. And so I, um, we're going to leave this particular culture here with a quote from Del Himes, which is a Native American poet of today. And he wrote a really, really long poem. But this is the very end of the poem. And it just says what our Native people felt about Coyote being with them. He says, never will he go from this land. Here, always, as long as the land is, that is how Coyote is in the land. Then there came a great change to the new world. So now, going from a culture of living very close to the earth, to of respect for wildlife, of understanding them and knowing them, to a totally different culture, the European culture that invaded. And again, you see the new world. I put it there purposely there, new world, because it isn't a new world. It had been inhabited a long time before but they thought it was a new world. And so this is the place where um, Europeans invaded. And what's interesting is right now I want to talk to you about like backing up, backing up, backing up into history a little bit. Because as we historians say that we come to understand the past, then we see and look what's happening today. And then we can create a far better future. First you need to see the past as it really was. And so history is a prism through which we look to the future. And that's what we're going to strive to do now in reference to what happened to the life here on this American continent when the Europeans arrived. So when the European invasion of North America, um, th th there is, I, I could probably take a few courses about this. And so, it, but in a very short period of time, share with you the idea that when the Europeans came, um, you have to understand the Europe that they left. 
So historians say by the 1500s, basically biodiversity, wild carnivores were gone from the land. They were only in very remote areas of the Great Pyrenees, the Alps, and Eastern Europe. And so uh, uh, living with carnivores uh, just wasn't happening anymore. Also, there's great destruction to their forests. And if you see films today in some areas, especially of England, a place like that, it's just devoid of forest land that can never come back. And then also of, of topsoil. So there was great destruction to the earth at that time. And at that time as well, Europeans were in these wars with each other, lots and lots of wars. And they, as a result, what was happening is all the coffers of these kings and queens and monarchs and dictators, uh, all their funds were going out. And it's like, we got to find more money. And so, and by this time, they had learned to go on to the sea and great, build great boats. And so they adventured, of course, and then bumped into North America. Okay. Now the thing is that when the Europeans came to North America, they not only brought themselves, but they also brought their animals and all their belongings and their worldviews. So here we have the culture living here already for 17,000 years in this other culture on the opposite end of this, this, if you want to call it, line, comes. And so what was their worldview? We spoke more or less informally of the native people's worldview. So this is the worldview that came from Europe. And historians say this, and we see it written over and over again today, that this is the worldview. And I want to ask you as you're watching this, say, is any of this still alive and well today when you and I are living here? Is this the worldview that kind of focused? It was like the mystic of what had them act in any way upon the land or any life. So first of all, the worldview that we are separate from the rest of life. That is very powerful. We humans are above, we are separate. We're not connected in any way to anything that happens on the planet. Also, we're above all other life. And everything here on the planet is here for us humans. Mother Earth got it all ready for us, not for anyone else. And we can use it any way we want. And lastly, we can use it up now. Who cares about who comes after us? Okay, these are powerful worldviews. And as you can see, this is all alive and well today in our culture. And so the behavior that flowed from this worldview, and again, this is the part of history of going, oh, I don't want to go back to that part of history. Ah, sometimes we got to step back and say, this is the history. This is the history of how this country was founded and understanding that and respecting it and then going forward from that, not staying there. So this is the behavior. Control and violence. Control and violence was a powerful thing, all North and Central and South America that we have seen. And this violence was towards our native peoples, all, of, uh, all the life that's on the continents. Massive destruction of natural resources. Oh, any histories that you read um, talk about the very quick destruction of our forests here in Maine and anywhere across the country. Slaughter of our native peoples and wildlife. So 99% of all the native peoples that were on the continent when Europeans came basically um, um, died of either disease or slaughter. And wildlife the same way. And slavery as we all know. We know about slavery, but it's very interesting that people know that our native peoples were put into slavery as well. They were slaves to these people, and also they took them to the Caribbean to be slaves as well, our native peoples. An arrogant taking over of land and ownership, big time with our native peoples, and still today, to 300 years later, our native peoples are still calling for that. And the land taking over of land for our, native pe for our native wildlife, where they had no place to go, and amassing of wealth. I put that at the bottom. That's kind of like the foundation of it all. 
amassing of wealth, which is a huge piece of the culture that you and I live in. So their worldviews permeated their behaviors towards the land and all the life. It was this undercurrent or this mystique and that, from those worldviews, all their actions kept moving in the last 500 years. So I want to show you this example. So here in Maine, we love our forests, don't we? And so right now, I'm speaking right now in the autumn, it's absolutely totally beautiful. We love our, and what do we love to do? I know for me, I love walking in our forest in the autumn. It's just so amazing and beautiful. So you know what the Europeans call this? And this is called, historians say this. These are actual true terms used. This, from as far as the Europeans were called, that, that's the total wasteland. That's a wasteland. You know why? It's not being used. It's not being used by us. This is what they like to see. This is the worldview, the mystique, of how it was in Europe and how they wanted it to be here. Ah, you see? Take all the trees down, put huge numbers of herbivores, monocultures of herbivores, and you notice no one else is there. No one in the sky <laughs> and no one on the land. This was how they saw it. And they went from the Atlantic to the Pacific in creating that kind of a, a view of the landscape, which we still see today in many places. And so as you can see, as they moved, they covered the plains and our, our, our bison who evolved with the land and the, the, the food that they ate, um, by the 1800, by, by 1880s, there were about 25 to 50 bison out of billions that survived the slaughter and were taken to Yellowstone National Park. And our bison are those. Um, and it was the people who started raising their voices. It was the people who stopped it. Otherwise, we would have no bison here in, in May, in our, our continent. So from the bison, and you can see large herds of bison and healthy, beautiful prairies, they call the Serengeti of the Americas, were once here, but they're gone. And so instead, they filled it with tens of thousands of non-native cows and sheep. And early on, it's very interesting, um, you gotta think you know, of the cowboys um, and, you know, kind of like romantic cowboy things. But actually, that's really not how it was. Become very soon going out into the West. Remember, money was the big piece. Capitalism is the very big piece. And they saw, we can get some great wealth here. And so it was very controlled by Wall Street and the British early on. So they brought all kinds of, of, um, of non-native who in time have destroyed the prairies. But today... There's wonderful things going on out there who are trying to recover this and bring our bison back to the native peoples, but that's for another talk. <laughs> but there's good things happening. Slowly, we're healing the land. Now, so what happened is, these were cattle and sheep barons who raised really powerful power in very soon. Didn't take them long to be very powerful on the land. And what they did is they got rid of the native peoples and the only ones that could be on the prairie, as far as they were concerned, were the cows and sheep. All the others had to go, including a predator birds like the golden eagles. And so it was an out and outright battle. Basically, it, it was a, a, a total genocide of our native peoples that most Americans are not aware of. It's an all and all out killing of them. Um, and so uh, they saw that as a roadblock to um, their massing wealth. And so Predator Coal was um, initiated. And in about uh, 19, 1915, around there, these powerful, powerful groups of the West, and mostly from very, very rich cattlemen connected to Wall Street and Britain, they, uh, they went to the government, U.S. government, and said, we want you to pay a whole bunch of trappers. And we want you know, to go out and kill. We want the government to take care. And so that happened. And so from that time up until almost the 1970s, there's unbelievable slaughter that none of us have ever seen because they're all gone now. Okay? And so, um, and you can tell the look on these men's face. They're pretty proud. These, these are wolves. 
and coyotes that they've killed in innumerable numbers. So, so by the 18, by 19, 1929, the last wolves were killed of the two million that we think were on the North American continent, and they were killed in Yellowstone National Park. But not coyote. Even though coyote, all this, uh, this, this um, predator control was powerfully hit on them as well. But coyote says, hey, I've been around here for five million years. You think you're getting rid of me? Too bad. I'll show you who I am. And so they are amazing. They are showing this amazing species that they are, that so many other species have been put on the brink of, of, of extinction and have been having to be called back again. So many of them, our peregrine fowlers, our swift fox, actually they're bringing swift fox back now to some of our Native American uh, um, traditional lands in the West. As, as, as I speak, the wolves have been brought back, but that's struggling. But coyote never left. But coyote did something very interesting. Okay, this is happening, let's see. What do I do now? What are we gonna do now to survive? So the thing is that there are more coyotes in North America today than the Europeans first came here. And so this is one of our coyotes here in Maine, down east. It's taken one of our coyotes down east. Isn't they beautiful? So our coyotes here in Maine look, um, um, they, look they can look different. They can be different sizes and have different wonderful colorations too and they continue to die. So why are their numbers increased? Well, first of all, two million wolves were exterminated. And remember I talked back about um, coyotes and territorialness? Well, canines are very territorial, and especially the three of them. So you have the big brother wolf, the little sister fox, and the in-between kid coyote. Wherever wolves were, coyotes were not because if coyotes entered wolf territory, they would be killed by wolves, okay? Little different between coyotes and foxes. Foxes just kind of stay away from coyotes in respect. You're, you're a little bigger than me. Coyotes don't tend to kill as much. They're highly evolved that way. And so because coyotes, do you think coyotes didn't notice? Hey, they're all gone. And they did notice. So they started expanding their range. The other reason they expanded their range, there was, it was a horrific persecution of them that I can't even speak about. I wouldn't even want you to hear. You can read about it though. That they ran from the persecution in, 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 the, in the West. Now there is, the forests were clear cut. So our beautiful Maine that we're enjoying right now in the autumn, a hundred years ago, you even recognize it. It was total clear cut, you know, and that was from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. So here goes Coyote, and they are dispersing and expanding their range, running from the persecution, and everything's clear cut. Well, who likes clear cuts? Coyote's favorite food, rodents, especially rodents, mice. And so that really helped Coyote move along, too, because of the food source. And lastly, there are more coyotes because coyotes are severely persecuted and continue to be persecuted today in all 48 states, 49 states. But you go, wait a minute now. There's more of them. How can you do persecution and more of them? Let me share that with you, okay? So it's all about coyote ecology and reproductive response. Here's a coyote mom. Now here's a Western coyote mom and her two coyote pups, okay? Coyotes have evolved survival. We're sticking around, we like it here. So they're always gonna find a way, no matter what they're up against, that they're gonna survive. So go back a little bit to coyote social life. So once coyotes are families, and then come, um, and they're dealing with, they're caring for their pups, teaching them to hunt during this whole time of, of, of spring and summer and into early fall, one of them may, one of them may disperse at this, at come November. Others disperse 
in their second or third year, they stay with their parents. And then when they do, they disperse and they find their mate. And here we see right here, two coyote mates. So they're very much like us, that we get to a certain age, bye mom, bye dad, we disperse. We find our mate. And then we're gonna go look for a home to live in. They do exactly the same thing. In fact, sociologists say that the whole cultural life of humans, because we are so close to wolves for so long and dependent on them, we're more like them in the social structure than we are as primates. So it's very, very interesting. So they find their mate, okay? So, and their territory. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about um, stable coyote populations and unstable populations. Um, and this is happening right here in Maine. So I like this word telos. You know, it's a Greek word. And it, what it means is that I have the freedom to follow my own goals and to express myself for who I am. That's telos. And so in stable populations of coyotes, they get to express their telos. So I'm gonna go take you to a place where this happens. Our Baxter State Park in Maine. The first time coyotes came to Maine in the late 60s and the 70s, Governor Baxter um, was absolutely that every single species in Baxter State Park was going to be protected. So coyotes have always been protected in Baxter State Park. This is kind of like what it looks like when in, in there. We can't see it, but these are like their territories, okay? And you can see basically these are home ranges that overlap a little bit. So these are different coyote families. And then inside there is their territory where no other coyotes live. So there's no sharing there. And that's a stable these are stable populations, okay, where they get to live their lives the way they want. And it moves about bits and pieces a little bit. Unstable populations, this is kind of like what it looks symbolized Why? So in an unstable population, you go from here, and basically it has to do with the year-round killing of coyotes. So you take this carnivore who has lived for millions of years, created these st stable, complex social lives, and then we're going in there and we're killing them. And it just disrupts, it creates tremendous chaos, very much like ourselves as well, what war does, hey, what coronavirus does to us, everything, anything that causes this disruption. And so what happens is, here's an example. So in this one, this is the only family here that survived the killing. All these others were killed. This is the only family here. These families, members of the families have been killed, not the whole family. So example, so this one right here, they could family, family of six. Three of them have been killed. What happens to those who are left? They have more food. There's more food for those three. Same here, this one can expand their range now, and those who are here have more food. Here, each one of these, they stay there and they cannot go anywhere else for their food. So they are limited in their food, you see. The whole food part, having enough to eat, has to do with reproduction. It's a big piece. This is an example. So stable populations of coyotes are those who are free to live their lives without persecution. Unstable, it's just the opposite. So here we go. So in stable populations here in Maine, um, coyote mates will have five or six pups. That's pretty much the norm, okay? And unstable, six to eight, however we've seen them, some research, up to 16 pups. When you see 16 pups, you know that they're, they're in chaos. That's not the norm at all for them. In stable populations, the pups are smaller because there's only enough food. We're in that territory and they're shared with the whole family. In the unstable population, the pups are larger because the mother had a lot of food to eat because maybe it was only her now and her mate, all the rest were killed. So when the mother has a lot of food, she can bring forth larger pups. In the stable populations, a third survive. So say for instance here in, in Baxter State Park, you will have six pups. A year later, 
they are lucky if one survives. Okay? And that has to do with everything of living in the wild in addition to being smaller and not having enough food or starvation is part of it. And in the unstable, most survive because there's always lots of food because there are not that many coyotes in the family because the others have been killed. In stable populations, the moms are four years old. Coyotes are very complex hunters like wolves. They need to be mature to have their pups and teach them to be good hunters. Um, and so they basically are four years old if they live that long. And, and the, unstable, the moms usually are yearlings. So basically the killing of a family, it throws them into chaos. And you remember the restrictions? There's one of the talks I was giving is that we're saying it's the only one that can give, a, um, give birth to pups in a coyote family, even though there are females there that can, is the mother, okay? And one of the men in my talk said, well, how do they keep them from, from mating? And I say, they block them. They will not allow anyone to mate. So it's a very controlled social system they have. However, when there's chaos, anything goes, and that's what happens. So you break that ordered world of theirs, and the teeny boppers are going, let's go. And that's actually what happens, and they are equivalent to a human, human teeny bopper. And of course, we know we don't want our daughters to be mothers when they are 13 years old. And neither do we want our 14-year-old boys to be fathers. So it's the same thing. And so the killing creates a lot of chaos that causes these teeny bopper parents. And again, only alpha gives birth, and I just shared that, and the other most females give birth because of the chaos, that that is not their norm. So they've broken them into chaos. And as a result, because the mothers are yearlings, they really are not really good hunters yet. So they're going, they got to feed them, and they have lots of pups. And there's a farm nearby. They got chickens. Hey, easy meal. So what happens is unstable populations of coyotes actually set them up to be in conflict with our farmers. So we have amazing farmers here in Maine who want to be have stable farm coyotes on their farm. So they want one family, and they get to know that coyote family. And and because and, they will not, they're very good hunters, and they will not ever go for their their um, their livestock because they don't need to, because they know how to hunt. So there's a lot of complexity to that human wild relationship. And lastly, in the stable populations, they're more like a normal curve. Okay, so the normal curve is we have all these little so here's some babies, a whole bunch of us in these middle ages, and then our elders. Same thing with coyotes. We don't see a lot of that now. A lot of what we're seeing is skewed to the young. With a whole bunch of young coyotes, we don't have that many of their elders. When you lose the elders in a culture, whether it's human or wild, you're losing something really important. And that, for myself as a scientist, I'm very concerned about that. Because when people first went, went across the prairies, they saw coyotes. They would see families of 20 coyotes with massive territories of 50 square miles, and they would see all age levels. It's evident. We don't have that today because of what has happened since the Europeans have come. So when all this happened to coyote, all this changed in coyote's world, coyote changed their happen, and they went, they went up went traveling. So they went further into Canada. They followed the gold rush into Alaska. Lots of animals died up there and on the way, like the mules, and they found. And they went further into Mexico, and now they're down all the way into Panama now. They crossed the Mississippi <clears throat> into the southern part of the United States. <clears throat> and then they went through Indiana and Ohio. Um, through the mid-Atlantic, and then our coyotes here in the Northeast, and we know this from DNA studies, is they went through the Great Lakes. And we also know that they were females. So the original ones, the original pioneers, were female coyotes that went through the Great Lakes. They met up over here in Ontario with the Algonquin wolves, 
in Yangonkong Provincial Park. And we believe that those wolves were the same wolves that lived here in Maine before the Europeans came. And so the Algonquin wolves are, are American wolves. They're not like the gray wolf that go back and forth to Asia. The Algonquin wolves, we believe that about 95,000 years ago, they actually split off an ancient coyote. So coyotes and them are very close. So the Canada never has done what the, what the United States has done to wildlife. In fact, we are the only country in the entire world that has out and outright actual slaughter of our wildlife, paid by the government. Um, Canada didn't do it, but they aren't really good to them either. So there was a lot of issues of killing of wolves there. So here comes Little Miss Female Coyotes. Da, 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 da. Here's a male wolf. He can't find a ma uh, mate. What do they do? They mate because they're so close that way. And then what happened is their progeny then came down into the Noun East. So they came into Maine, New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, up into New Brunswick. In time, they took time and they, they jumped the ice flows to Greenland, okay? And so they're in Greenland as well. They're great, powerful swimmers as well. And so our coyotes here are a little bit different than the Western ones, but they're coyote through and through. Totally have a little bit of wolf genetics in them. And basically the difference is what happened is because their mother was a coyote, the difference is they have large bones in the head here, powerful jaws. That's kind of what they got out of it. But they're all slightly different in their percentages too. But their behavior, their survival, is coyote 100 percent is coyote and you know all our, our canines in this country have been doing this kind of exchanging of things for what we can tell from research they've been doing it for for millennia so this is nothing new they just keep adapting okay and so from the southwest so here's a little coyote in the southwest is a coyote that live in Arizona New Mexico about 20 pounds and look at the coat very light coat very hot, very dry. Look, look at the landscape, very dry. From the southwest, where they came, it's the forest of the northeast and Maine. They adapted just like that. Not only to this, but six to 10 feet of snow on top of it and cold. And they've adapted and resilient and found their way. And they keep adapting and keeping it. Coyotes constantly, re as fellow biologists say, they're constantly recreating themselves and recreating. So we're living with really an amazing species. I feel very honored as a biologist that this is a species that I study and I speak about. And so a fellow biologist that done research in Yellowstone, a great deal about coyotes say, coyote is actually the absolute incredible masterpiece of evolution and that we are participating in it and we are observing it in, in our lifetime. So these are coyotes, these are two Quebec coyotes. So these are our eastern coyotes. Do you see the other one that I showed you, that little one from the southwest? Okay, these are eastern coyotes and you take a look at their coat too, how different their coat is. And you can even tell how their head, you see how their, the bone in their head is even through their fur. So the universe has a great design. It's totally faultless in its operation. So we're kind of moving now from history to um, kind of sharing with you what it is about coyote that's valuable in e their ecology. And you know, um, these are little coyote pups that Dr. Harrison from the University of Maine was doing research on in Acadia in 1985 when they, was it 85? Yes, when they first came to Acadia. And, um, and so, you know, the universe has this great design and we think about this time right now is as the migrations of our birds. I have these little Phoebes that live near me and I'm thinking, where are they now? You know, the, 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 it is amazing, the migrations of the birds. It's amazing when we look out our window, how our trees are attuned to the light and the changing and the colors. And that when we have earthquakes and volcanoes, the, this is the earth knowing what she's doing. And, and so another big piece that nature's created is the, um, 
predator-prey relationship. So the predator-prey relationship, we would not have a green earth. Um, life would be really not in balance if you didn't have the predator-prey relationship. And that starts from predator-prey in the soil that we and I don't see to the skies, to the ocean. So people think of predator-prey as justly our, 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 our big ones, like our cougars and our coyotes and our wolves, but it goes on all the time, okay? And it's invaluable in keeping balance and health of the system. So coyote here in Maine, wherever wolves are not, coyote plays the role of the keystone. And what the keystone is, is the key, when the coyote kills an animal to live, they affect the whole system. I show you a little bit about that. So, coyotes doing what they love to do. Their favorite food is rodents. Is it that they're their only food? No, no way. Coyote has a very, very uh, diverse diet. And rodents are a huge um, part of their diet. And big piece is balancing their populations and controlling disease. So, rodents, though small, carry disease. And one of them is Lyme disease. Okay. Coyote can control the Lyme disease epidemic we have here in Maine, but at this time are not able to because they cannot practice their telos. Okay. But um, so they have a huge, they can have a great effect on disease and Lyme disease is only one of them that rodents carry. There are many others and we're discovering more and more of them as we keep shifting the earth and changing around. And coyote and smaller carnivores. So coyote also relates with raccoons, foxes, and skunks. And the same thing, they balance populations and control disease. These particular, these are called meso carnivores, middle carnivores, smaller carnivores. These three carnivores, in federal research has shown, these three are very, very sensitive to rabies. They get it like that. Coyotes have the least amount of rabies than any species in North America. They're on the other edge of the spectrum. So when coyote, um, coyote can prey on raccoons, they can prey on skunks, they help keep their populations down so they're not having too many of them that spread the rabies to each other. So having this larger carnivore control their populations, same with foxes. Coyotes control foxes populations just like wolves control coyotes populations. Where coyotes are, foxes tend not to be. They kind of, they're kind of like on the outskirts of coyote territory. So it really controls fox populations that way, which actually helps the foxes. So they aren't, there aren't so many of them and then passing rabies on because it's a horrible disease that they suffer from and we are terrified of as well. And so people often ask me, well, what about our deer? And I say, coyote is the best thing that's happened to our deer herd since our last wolves left here. Our deer here in Maine have lived with wolves for tens of thousands of years. They know how to live with the predator, okay? And actually the predator has kept our deer herds healthy and stable, robust. And, and this is how it works. I always tell people this little one right here, that's not a Bambi. That's not Bambi. Yet it's a wild fawn. And it's interesting how nature works. Pay attention to timing. So fawns are born mid-May to mid-June. That's also the same time that wild canines like coyote and also the bears are bringing up their little cubs and bobcats as well. So coyotes, bears, bobcats can control these fawn populations. However, they're only going to get the ones that are not the smartest, the swiftest, the sharpest. Those are smart, sharp, swift, fast. No predator will get. And they will grow up and give their pass on their great genetics. And we're finding in research that when there are predators around prey animals like deer, elk and all that, our deer tend to get bigger. Basically what we're saying, they become more robust, okay? And, but we're being able to do that. And also coyote in rough times takes a, I call it the merciful nature. When deer are starving in winter, 
break their legs. We find that 25 percent of the deer that are shot during hunting season go into the forest and take a long time to die. Coyotes end it quickly. And so there's a different ways that they will do it. But in doing so, deer are an herbivore and they're a large herbivore. And they can destroy the home of a lot of other wildlife that really, really requires what they are eating. And these are them. Birds, bees, butterflies, on and on. So birds require the forested areas, they require also you have your birds who are ground nesters. Bees need to have flowers and plants that they can pollinize. But if they've been eaten up by, by the deer, they can't, they, there's nothing available to them. Same with butterflies. So coyote plays a really important role in, in, within these insectivores and pollinators that they play this role, but at the same time, are really helping our deer herds to be healthy and robust and strong. So the system of predation works for the health of all species, including us. Predation actually drives biodiversity. And in this time of climate change, biodiversity is of the utmost importance because if one doesn't make it, another, another one is there to make it. If you only have one, and the numbers are singly like that, that that one of that kind are gone. So we're coming to the last part of my talk, which is coyote and us. Remember? Okay. So we just talked about all the, uh, this, the, the ecology of this important carnivore that are very new to people of the East, okay? Even um, people aren't even learning in school. Our children aren't even learning in school. And teachers don't even know how to teach it because they weren't taught. So this is very, very new. That's why I do what I do. So let's see what kind of protection they get in this day and age. Not 300 years ago when we wouldn't expect it, but now. So you know about, mm, you know, about right around the early 1900s, Teddy Roosevelt was a big, quite a hunter. And a lot of other hunters said, um, were very concerned, both of them, you know what, if we don't do something, there's not going to be any hunting because at that time it was free for all. There were no rules or regulations. People could go right out and just kill 10 deer and let their bodies lie. And that's happened with our caribou. And that's why we have no more caribou left here. And so they said, we got to do something about it. And so what happened as a result is that we created the, each state has an, um, an wildlife agency here in Maine, it's Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And they were instituted to say, we are going to count. We're going to see how many deer we have and where are they and how many does, okay? And then we're going to tell you, this is where you can hunt. This is the time of the year you can hunt. This is who you can hunt, male or female. And this is what you can use to hunt. And when you've hunt them, you've got to come and show them to us because we want to make sure that we keep having those deer here. And so as a result of creating these restrictions on human behavior and not a free for all, um, we have had over 100 years of traditional hunting here in Maine because of it. And it would not be. Many, many states in the east of Mississippi had to reintroduce deer. Can you believe it? In the early 1900s. That's how, that's how it was back then. Very different now. So how, what, is, what, is, um, what about the rules for coyote? So here are the regulations for coyotes. So the state of Maine hunting regulations. So they permit the killing of coyotes here in Maine year round, okay, with no limits. So if an individual wants to kill a coyote, they can kill 50 of them in a day and keep going. Permit night killing. So day and night, day and night. So when the coyotes are bringing up their pups, this is going on. Can you imagine being a parent and having that where there's no time where I can hunt for my pups, where I'm safe? And as a result, what happens is oftentimes the parents are killed and the pups die of starvation in their dens. This happens a great deal here in Maine. People just, it's a very unseen suffering. 
And that's why it goes on. Oh, and the only reason the night killing is not allowed from August 31st to December 16th is that's deer hunting season. And there's a great deal of poaching that goes on of deer, our deer here in Maine, even though it's against the law. So they're afraid there'd be even more poaching. So that's why they can't do it then. And that permit chasing to exhaustion, killing of, um, of coyotes by dogs, which is a huge issue to private property rights here in Maine. Many private property people um, have some really bad experiences with that and permit the killing games. So here you go. We're having this fun weekend. And you're going to win this prize if you bring in the most, the biggest coyotes, the most coyotes, the most bo bobcats. And we're talking about important carnivore and they're turning it into a game for fun. And so I just want to ask you, uh, you, you know, is this, is this the kind of protection we in our hunting state would give to this important carnivore? I will ask you, but I won't answer it. So this is just one example of um, what comes of it, I told about pups. Pup, the pups, um, orphan pups, are um, a big result of a lot of the killing. So this is a nine week old pup, okay? So they're barely out of the den. And this, this pup saw both his parents shot and killed in front of their eyes and the siblings shot by a man. What happened with this little pup, the only reason this little one survived, the granddaughter of the man who did this, come running towards this little pup, whooped him up, and found a friend and went to the veterinarian. And this little pup is in the veterinarian. And the man, as you can see, shot the bullet in this little pup's, little pup's paw. This is, this is one that's seen. There's a great deal of unseen orphaned pups that happen here in Maine. And people need to know that there is a lot of that suffering. Um, this, this veterinarian had a powerful experience with wildness in caring for this little coyote pup. So in the other aspect of, of this lack of protection is that, I, would, I see this sign. Oh, on the, on the interstate coming here today, it said, it was re referring to the coronavirus, says, we're all in this together. And I'm going, we're all in this together too. So whenever one aspect of a of, of fellow kin is something is being abused, what happens, we feel it too. It just, you cannot not. And so what happens is, um, first of all, um, a great deal, our farmers are affected, like I told you before. When coyotes are killed and they're put into chaos, that's what sets up the conflict with our coyotes. Um, there's a, um, and I can go on and on a lot of stories about that, but I don't want to keep you forever and ever, but it happened. And the thing is, what's interesting is our farmers know this. So our farmers who are really enlightened and knowledgeable say, I want my coyotes on my farm. And anyone attempts to come there and kill them, they will not let them because they understand that they live very well in peace with them. And so it caused a lot of issues where there is this running of the dogs, and causing these issues on farms. And there are many, many that people have shared with me, but I'll keep you here for a long time and I'm not gonna do that otherwise. So, and also um, private property rights, huge issues with private property rights, in fact, they, and bullying and bullying as well. People have actually been accosted by individuals feel we have total freedom to go and kill whatever you do. And so they feel total freedom to be abuse their fellow humans too. It's very interesting that the whole social structure that happens. Um, yeah, because we're all in it together. So coyotes are saying, we're giving you a chance to reconsider your relationship with nature. Hey, you know those people, you know, in 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and they did that to wolf. I'm back. I'm giving you another chance. What do you think? You know? So a lot of it has to do with this willingness to have wildness flourishing in a settled place like Portland, your town, your town, everywhere, Berwick, to recognize um, this is their home too and live in peace with them as our native peoples did. And it's very, very new for our culture because we've lived without large carnivores. So we're, we're stretching ourselves. So it's coexistence. And coexistence, living in the same place in peace, some people have issues with it, say, okay, I want you to trap them, then you go take them out in the wild somewhere. It's like, no, this is their home. 
And so a lot of town managers have been so amazing. They're into the education part. You know, they're, they're part of our community. They do road and patrol for us. They do road and patrol when you're sleeping. So it's a shared space and yet a safe space. So if we know how to coexist with them and we have the skills, it would be like our native peoples was that. There was no fear in our native peoples. None of that. No reason we're going to poison, we want to kill, we want to trap. You never, that was something unheard of for them because it was a, one of mutual respect and knowledge. And they knew how to be with them. So, big piece is keeping coyote wild. We want our coyotes to be wild coyotes. One of the ways, coyotes should never see us humans as a source of food. No begging. They have a job to do in the ecosystem, a very important one. That's where we want them. Plus, we also want them to have their telos, their life the way they want it to live. And eating food from us is not a wild coyote. So people say, what are that? People, let's talk about a few that we, people take for granted. Bird feeders. This is one that people get a little nervous about when I talk, but I found that a lot of other scientists are saying the same thing. Bird feeders were established as a ecologically an unhealthy thing to do. Because aren't we all taught, do not feed wildlife? And what are our birds? They are wild. And they, like coyote, have a job to do in the ecosystem. And if they're coming and begging at our beer feeder, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing in the ecosystem, okay? And so it also favors certain birds and not others, and also draws rodents up the yin-yang right into your porch. And that is the place the coyote sees all the little rodents running around at night, your bird feeder, and coyote comes closer and says, hey, humans, food, humans, food, I'll stick around here. And we do that without even thinking about it, okay? I had a woman from Harpswell contact me, and they live at a place where the coyotes are, have really um, healthy coyote families, and, um, and they're very supportive of them. They want them there. But one morning, they got up, and they saw a coyote scat on their deck. And she said, that's a little too close. So she contacted me. And so I first I said, do you have a bird feeder on your deck? Sure enough. Had a bird feeder on her deck. So while they're sleeping, all the little rodents are running around and coyotes are coming up to that bird feeder and taking out the rodents and the birds see. So I say, take your bird feeders down. And I know it's emotionally a very difficult thing to do for some people, but I do encourage you to do it. Even if you do one season or the other, if you want to see them, you want to Fill your, plant, your land with landscape that brings them to you, bushes and flowers, all those kinds of things that the birds would like, and trees. That's what you, they will be there year round then. Next, cats. That's another thing, cats. Coyote sees cats, they're not, oh, that's so-and-so's cat, I won't go after you. No, cat is kind of like a good size of a coyote's prey. And so we shift then. Before this time, cats were running around everywhere, huge issues with feral cats here in Maine and otherwise. Um, tens of thousands of them are euthanized in our shelters. So a lot of it is human irresponsibility. Oh, we don't like to say that, do we? But it is. And what happens is Coyote's kind of coming to teach us. See, I want to teach you something. You ought to keep the cats inside because it's much better for songbirds who are finding that billions of songbirds are being killed by domestic cats. So you bring coyote in, people take their cats inside and not play the predator outside and also be safe. And our bird pop, songbird population starts going up because they're protect. Actually, research has shown this, which is fascinating. It doesn't take long to see nature rebound when you have that balance again. So keeping cats inside and farm animals, that's another whole thing. And I work with farmers, one of my favorite things to do, I help our farmers with animal husbandry practices, guardian dogs and all that. Can't get into that one. But coyotes should just never see our farm animals as a source of food, ever. 
And if they're, they're, they're stable and they are really good hunters and have a relationship with their farmer, they don't see the farm animals as food. And food for your domestic animals of any kind. Any, any, any food for your domestic animals should never be outside. And how you handle trash. Research has been done in Chicago, urban uh, coyotes for 20 years, and they say coyotes are not into trash. They really like their wild food. However, coyotes' prey goes to trash. So you're drawing coyote in again, saying, oh, humans, they have all this stuff, and it's drawing some of my prey. I'm going to go by humans. So being very clean with their fresh. Fruits, coyotes have a sweet tooth, quite the sweet tooth. They love named blueberries. They do raspberries, too. And we know wolves. We found wolves doing it as well. And they love apples. Actually seen coyotes climbing trees to get apples. So they have fun. They know how to live. So if you have apple trees and everything, and you don't want to draw them that close, then you pick up the apples from the ground, OK? Um, I would encourage that. So I want to share you this. This is an example. I, I kind of put this in just for your town because it happened in your town, which is so it's special for you and it helps you. So I was just talking about uh, how humans draw all kinds of, of, of um, rodents all by having all that trash. So all kinds of food. And, and wildlife knows that we humans are a source of food. A lot of them do. And rodents, number one. But however, is we draw the rodents in and go, no, we don't want you. And then what do humans use? Poisons. So they put poisons in their basement. The rodents eat it. They go outside. And the way these poisons you use that people can get ahead of is the rodent slowly bleeds to death. But it takes time. In the meantime, the carnivore comes and eats the rodent. And if you have carnivores like coyotes, they're, they're living on a lot of rodents. They're taking in more and more poison. And what that poison does is suppress their immune system. And we're seeing a lot more than we ever should see of mange in our wild carnivores. We've seen that in cougars in California that live. They get mange. We see owls that are having mange. Any species that are living any relatively any near humans where humans are using poisons. So this little coyote pup has severe mange. Severe mange. This little coyote pup should have this most beautiful, beautiful coat. Um, but they, what these, um, these rodenticides that are used in houses of poison, um, actually, they build up in the rodents' bodies. And so, as I said, the carnivores eat them. It suppresses their immune system. And so this is what happens. And this little coyote pup, and there were two of them that um, a community member here in Berwick saw. Okay, And so what happens is these microscopic parasites go into their um, hair follicles, drink it up, and their fur falls out. So this little coyote pup has next to no fur on him. And because of all the toxins, it makes their fur black. And when it gets worse, they have big open sores because they scratch like you can't believe. And because of it, they can't hunt. Um, and so if it's not treated or if they cannot fight it off, um, they die of excruciating slow deaths. And so, but they can be treated. So to a, commu a community, very compassionate community member here in Berwick actually contacted um, our, our um, um, Coyote Center Rehabilitation, and she's helping um, treat this little one when, she's still in, when they're still in the wild. So we are hoping that this little one and the sibling will act, have their fur coats back for winter time. So, um, so many ways, if you, uh, if you don't like the rodents in your house, the old-fashioned mouse trap is actually far more compassionate. Boom, right away. Or find ways that they cannot come into your house. And keep food is a huge issue of drawing rodents. And you see, again, we're all in this together. This is what happens, you see? It's that circle of how our human behavior can affect uh, um, uh, the lives of those who live with us. And so the last part of my talk is 
keeping coyotes wild is support protection of coyotes by law. So we want our coyotes to be wild and healthy and robust and live their telos and, and for do their work as a keystone here in Maine. And they cannot do it if this year-round killing continues. So supporting that protection by law of speaking to your legislators, we live in a democracy, we have great power. We have great power with our voice, great power. So lastly here, encounters with coyotes, very rare to have an encounter with coyotes. They do not want to see us. And, um, and, and they're, they're about their own lives. But if you do have an encounter with a coyote, it's very rare. And sometimes it's by accident. And sometimes it's a young, naive coyote who's like, didn't learn yet. You should stay away from humans. Don't let them see you. And that's, and so here's some kind of, so pup rearing time. So pup rearing time is very important for coyotes. So from about April all the way through September, at least is pup rearing time for coyotes. You need to know that if you have your dog and you take your dog into natural areas, coyotes could have a hidden den. So, and they will, your dog will sniff it out. And there, there have been many incidents of dogs threatening and terrifying coyote mates. And coyotes will not attack them. They're just trying to protect their pup. And they will protect their pups with their life. So during that time, you need to restrain your dog on a leash. Keep an, or very powerful um, that your, you and your dog have a relationship of listening to your commands and staying near you and just not letting them run off um, because we're sharing it with wild ones. That's a really important thing. And coyote during the daytime. A lot of people say, so I have coyote in the daytime, they must have rabies. No. Again, coyotes, it is unbelievably rare when coyotes are rare. Very, very rare. It's that during the daytime, when pup rearing time, coyote parents need to hunt day and night because their little pups eat a lot of food. So you'll see them more during that time. Um, and so if you see a coyote during the daytime, it's not because of their rabbit. Um, farmers see them during the daytime when they hay and they turn their tractor on and the coyote comes out of the woods and the coyotes, the farmer's doing the tractor and the coyote's back there picking off all the rodents on them. So that's a daytime thing. These farmers are used to it. They have a really good relationship with them. And coyote in your property. Coyotes hanging around on your property. Where's the food? Where's the food? If they're moving through your property, guess what? Your property is part of their territory, part of their much bigger territory, and they're just moving through. Coyote and your dog. Every dog and every coyote has a different relationship with each other, okay? Some dogs like to run off and say, I want to be a coyote now, and they leave, okay? There's a, it's very interesting relationships. What I suggest, you never allow your dog to relay with a coyote. We want to keep the wild wild and your dog domestic. However, our dogs do love to howl with coyotes. I've had many a person say, one journalist here in Maine said, when the coyotes start howling, their German shepherd throws his head up in the air and they're howling away. And I think it's kind of cool because our dogs have this wild peace in them that the coyotes are bringing back that memory in them. So I think it's really kind of cool. And that's the part we should be looking at, okay? Otherwise, if you have really little dogs, these little five-pounders, coyotes looking at and going, you're no dog, you're no dog, you know? And so when you have these tiny, tiny dogs that humans have manipulated to be that small, you need to be protective of them. And you just don't leave them out at dusk when the predators start hunting. So just it's this awareness. These are called coexisting skills, just having awareness. If a coyote approaches you, which again, that is so, so rare. I would say the times that that would happen would probably be a naive young coyote. But this is even for children too. Throw your hands up in the air and yell very, very aggressively. Before you know it, they're gone. Most time coyotes see you, they run, they hide. We don't have a good relationship with coyotes. Do not see us humans the way they saw our native peoples at all. At all. They don't want to see us. So in the end, 
what you can do as a Maine citizen, and we're all in this together, is educate yourself. Because when you educate yourself about our returning carnivores, and especially our keystone carnivore, life's rich. When you don't educate yourself, there's a lot of fear. And educate your friends and neighbors. Share and share and share. And teach your children to respect and have wonder, not fear. There's too much of that in our world today. Wonder and respect about all of the life. And support our farmers who sustainably farm with carnivores, because lots of them do. They can tell you some cool stories. And that's right to your legislators. And wow, is this a great time of the year, in coming October and the elections, um, to write to your legislators and say, we respect our coyotes, we want them protected. That's all you got to say. That is all you have to say. You don't have to know all the science. <laughs> um, and so, who do you see? Who have we learned to see? Thank you.